So for those of you who just joined us, welcome. This is the second event today of the Sustainable Environmental Design Program, the EMARC, the, the finishing week of the EMARC. Um, and now we have our keynote lecture, which uh, will be given by three of our graduates who have formed a company, a practice of their own, Atmos Lab. I'd like to introduce them it's with some pride that uh, I would like to introduce them, in addition to the great pleasure of seeing them, welcoming them back to the AA. So we have Rafael Alonso, who graduated from the Polytechnic University of Valencia in Spain, and then came to our remark. We have Olivier D'Ambron, who studied engineering at the Haute Etude in France. Uh, and we have Florencia, who would have liked very much to be with us uh, in person, but as you can see, she's very well with us in, in image. So, uh, welcome guys, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, then, thank you very much for your invitation, um, and then your nice introduction as well. It's unfortunate that Florencia cannot be with us today, but she's very present in the room, like Simos just said. Um, and thanks to Ben, the video call is working perfectly. So, yeah. um, Florencia, Rafael, and, and myself, we co-founded Atmos Lab in 2016, about six years ago, uh, right after SCD, uh, the postgraduate program. So uh, for us, it's quite a um, it's quite something, quite a special honor to, to come back here today and to share this, this lecture. For today, we selected um, a couple of short stories about some of our projects in different climates. We wanted to touch on how climate defines architecture, uh, the importance of research and consistency, also on intermediate spaces, and finally on the importance of valorizing the existing. So I'll leave it to Florencia to, to kick off with everything. Thank you very much. I cannot see this. Thank you. So uh, to start with a little bit of our work philosophy and what we call our practice, not only on the SED master, but how we think. So in a context where human impact is leaving a costly imprint on its homeland, Atmos Lab helps architecture face environmental challenges of our time with built-in common sense. Playing with temperature, sunlight, or wind, we provide a climate-responsive frame of mind and healthier solutions to build with. More efficient, more comfortable, more sustainable. So everything we do is based on, on this master degree. Next. So we are all well aware of the climate challenge we face today with how grave the situation is. Temperature anomalies on Earth coincide with the rise in carbon emissions by, by, made by man, which in their turn are very linked to the mass production of air conditioning and a new way of designing based on machines. But we as architects have a greater responsibility in this and we need to know our part on how to improve this. So according to the UN status report, 39% of the global status report, 39% of the total carbon emissions linked to energy consumption are due to buildings, their construction and use. So this is our part as architects. And from these, more or less, for the case of uh, residential and office buildings, this is just uh, for London, but representative as, a, as numbers. So 55 to 70% are of the energy consumption of buildings, offices and residents are controllable by us architects. So here we, we want to bring some stories from, from, from the practice to, to, to show how we tackle this. And in general, what we see is that the global temperature change plus the energy shortage uh, uh, asks us for a need for adaptation and for more independence. So up until very recently, the only way of tackling this was uh, with very uh, highly insulated envelopes like a thermos, so closed uh, with very little contact with the outdoors and opening a window there seemed to be like a, a problem when 
It created a, a very high dependence on mecha mechanical equipment. Temperature adjustments were done by equipment, air renewal as well, and lights were al almost always uh, electric, like one of the dissertations that we saw before. So this is, was a very heavy um, dependence on energy consumption. But what we want to, to vouch for is a more bioclimatic concept, uh, adaptable envelopes to work with the climate, to depend on its connection with the climate, to adjust the temperature through the envelope, the air renewal as well, and to use natural light. So we, we vouch for the use of renewable natural resources. And in creating this, also remem remembering the, the pleasure of living, right? The pleasure of being in a nice outdoor space, in a nice intermediate space, is never the same as that sealed uh, envelope that, that used to, to be. We, we want to also remember the, the nice things about the space and architecture, like outdoor spaces or winter gardens, like we are seeing in, in this image. So the first set of stories is about the importance of climate, how we helped to define two specific projects based on climate. Some time ago, we were about to start two projects, the Crystal Palace, a mixed-use building with office Captain Gias David and Severin in Seoul, in Korea, and the Ministry of Finance and Economy, which was done by the Development Ministry in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. So when we received the first sketches, both both buildings look very similar. If you see both, they, they have very similar features. The concept was the same, mostly offices organized organized in a cloister with a glazed roof in the, in the in the middle of the patio, let's say, and a glazed facade in the perimeter. But, but both buildings were located in completely different climates. So Seoul is continental and cold with dry winters and hot summers, whereas Buenos Aires is temperate humid subtropical with hot summers and mild winters. During summer, both climates reach an average temperature of 20 high, 25 and an average high around 29, which is pretty hot. However, if we look at the solar radiation in Seoul, summer is very, very cloudy and humidity becomes a very important problem. And direct solar radiation is almost inexistent. You can see in, in the months of July and August, I don't know if you can point from there. In Buenos Aires, have, uh, the, the opposite uh, happens. So direct solar radiation in summer is very high, even higher than the, than the equator, for example, and it becomes the main problem to tackle. Winter are also very, winters are also very different. In Seoul, the average temperature of January is below zero, and temperatures can reach minus 15. Whereas in Buenos Aires, winters are very mild, and average temperature is around 10 degrees. Whereas in the afternoon, it is very common that temperatures can go above 15 degrees. So our task was to make sure that the buildings adapted to the corresponding climates. <coughs> this was the final design for the Crystal Palace. So this is the interior courtyard covered by some ETFE panels. And so this building, in this case, the building remained covered. And on the north wing, there was a startup center. On the south one, a 50 plus campus, on the west one, residential spaces, and on the east, a non-profit organization center. So from the outside, the building kept its fully glazed facade, even in, in this cold climate, as there were adaptations. This is how it looked. So what we brought to this case, to, to this specific project, it can be uh, summarized into resiliency, a solar programmatic distribution, thermal buffers, and an, and an optimization of the ventilation. So now I'm going to go just one by one. So the first point was about resiliency. So what pr we proposed is that the roof of the courtyard became operable. So during winter, the roof is closed, capturing the sun and creating a courtyard with a milder climate. Those minus 15 and are, are very, very cold and we need nicer conditions to be able to be outdoors. Whereas in summer, it opens. Because there is an, such high solar radiation, a glazed roof is not a big problem. But what the building needs is to ventilate. So in winter, the roof is closed and the building is compact. But in summer, the roof is open and the building becomes very porous. The second thing that we added was about the solar power programmatic distribution. So what we did was to calculate the solar gain in each facade and to understand how it was distributed. And at the same time, 
we calculated the internal gains uh, in the building and, and how each one would uh, translate and how the the quantities communicated with each other. So how much a startup, a startup center produces heat, how much a residential space. space. So here in, on the graph top right, uh, you can see all the internal gains and the solar ones. So the internal gains are to the left and the solar ones to the right. We call this a thermodynamic balance. So what we proposed was that the program with more internal gains, for example, the startup center, could be located where there were less solar gains and the program with less internal gains, for example, the residential of the 50 plus, 50 plus campus, could be located in the area that receives the most solar gains. So the, the scale is actually very similar. If we added a program with a large amount of internal gains with large, large amount of solar radiation, it would be too hot in general. And if we added a, a program with small internal gains with small solar radiation, then temperature would not be enough. And like this, we can create a, a balance in between the solar and the internal gains. The third concept was about thermal buffers so that the intermediate spaces were created between a certain climate and the exterior. So the first one uh, is on the courtyard. So the, the in between the courtyard outdoors is the ground. So the air that enters the courtyard passes first through the ground, which is at an intermediate temperature. So whereas outdoor temperature varies from minus two to four, the ground was at nine and the patio was varying from 11 to 15. So that, that ground was acting as a term, thermal buffer from the outside to, to the patio. The second thermal buffer is the patio itself because it's, it is at an intermediate temperature in between outdoors and indoors. So all the windows from all the spaces in the perimeter could open to that intermediate space, to that milder climate uh, compared to, to outdoors. So while the patio has temperatures from 11 to 15, uh, indoors temperature varies, temperature varied naturally from 16 to 22. And lastly, in the residential spaces where internal gains are lower and occupation happens all day and night, winter gardens were added. So when outdoor varied from minus two to four, the winter garden could vary from 25, from 15 to 25 naturally. And what we did lastly was to optimize the summer ventilation. So the ground floor opens <coughs> to the main winds coming from the west and air flows inside the courtyard. It opens in a venturi effect. And at occupant height uh, in the patio, the wind speed is around two meters per second, which reduced the thermal sensation for quite a lot. So that was for the adaptations of the first project of the Crystal Palace. And then comes the Ministry of Finance and Economy in Buenos Aires. The building was inserted in a former prison, which is the, the lower part in here, but what we studied mostly was the, the upper part. So in this case, everything was an office space, pretty tight with the main open space facing east and west. So the long wings are facing east and west. So in this case, what we brought to the project was first eliminating the roof, second, further solar protection, a ventilation strategy and adding thermal inertia to provoke a thermal lag. So as mentioned before, the key problem in Buenos Aires is the sun and it's a southern hemisphere and it is a southern hemisphere. So the sun is coming from the north and very vertically during the hottest months. So we calculated all incident radiation on facades in summer. The legend here is intuitive, meaning that the redder, the more radiation in all the facades. So we can have a, a very quick sense that there is an, if with a building as it was, there was an excessive radiation in all the facades. So starting from the initial radiation calculations, which are the, the first line in this, in this graph, we propose to add balconies on all the orientations and test it different lengths with different forms of vertical protection to understand what was enough to protect from the sun. So we just added a 50 centimeters balcony, a one meter balcony, and we assess how much we were reducing solar radiation to actually recommend what could be done. We also modified the ventilation strategy. So originally they had done one module out of six that was a parable, which is what is commonly uh, done nowadays. 
but you can imagine that like this only one row of people can open their window so if this person here on the on the left open its winter its window for example in winter for fresh air they can be very cold whereas whereas the one on the other side will not we never had a good air renewal so what we did was to propose to divide the the window in two vertically so an upper part for winter ventilation and a lower part for the summer one and in this one one window should be operable per row and another advantage of the upper window is that it can be left open at night so the project already had exposed concrete to capture the heat during the day and it only had to be released at night for night flush. Next slide. So indoor temperatures are naturally two to four degrees lower during the day if we actually uh, add this natural ventilation, uh, night ventilation strategy. So overall, we had two different concept designs that ended up by being by being the same overall concept, but with its proper adaptation to its to their climate, so that they could. Uh, have a, a fair enough performance. The first one was a competition that we didn't win, and this one is under construction today in Buenos Aires. So just to move on as a way of working, and also because even if the princip principles of our disciplines are old, proving them scientifically is not that widespread. So research is a fundamental part of our work, and this also leads to consistent projects that build up uh, on each other. So to continue on the Buenos Aires climate, we are carrying out a research project with the students of the Tela University about the architecture of La Imira Costa. I actually started this research in SED. This was my research paper too. And now we're trying to, um, to expand it. Uh, Acosta designed a, a system to intervene in the climate of Buenos Aires with scientific studies and evidence back in 19, the 1930s. And what he created is an architecture that belongs to its climate. This house that is from the modern period clearly corresponds to a warmer climate than most of the foundational and modern work from any of the well-known ones, could be Le, Co Le Corbusier or Mies, but it doesn't correspond to, to a warm climate as the Brazilian one, for example, to a warmer one. It is different from the work of Niemeyer. So, Understanding uh, what these kind of people do is, is important for us uh, as, as a research uh, in general. He studied all sorts of solar angles to come up with a clever shading system that is adapted to the climate of Buenos Aires. And together with all sorts of adaptable devices in, in the envelopes he designed. Here you can see uh, everything that he, he used to put in his, in his windows. So understanding his architecture, valuing his works provide, provides us a framework for the intervention in temperate warm climates. And on the other side of the spectrum of the temperate climates, we started a research project some four years ago with a French practi practice, La Caton Vassal, about their, their winter gardens. Today, luckily, they are pretty well known uh, because they won the, the Pritzker Prize not so long ago. And actually, their work is remarkable in, st in terms of environmental purposes and we we started this research to understand how how their their winter garden works how they actually work in reality and to take lessons for for their practice so these winter gardens are are these intermediate spaces that we see here and heated of course without a specific program in between the main building and the exterior it's a space to enjoy and that is that is actually very, very good for the environmental performance of the building. These types of spaces have been relegated from the environmental agenda as configurations did not seem to bring much benefit to the parent building, and they presented a higher risk in summer than a benefit in winter. But like Aton Vassal have been working with them in a novel way, as they have domesticated the technology of agricultural greenhouses. And those are engineered to work with the sun, wind, and light, and of which indoor conditions and control are controlled with the use of geotextiles, adaptive structures and nets. So they, they brought a new way of doing winter gardens, which is very consistent. And it shows from the exterior, most of the, of their buildings looks like this. And because they have been just perfecting this concept for the past 30 years, and now we studied it so that they can improve it further 
in the projects to come. So winter gardens as, as are used as building envelopes and free space. So more people can choose how to use, when to occupy, and how to furnish. The double envelope is inexpensive and creates houses that can function in a non-uniform way. And the next slide will show how they look from the inside again. They're the, they use it in a very systematized way as well. The their winter gardens are always facing south and following the main living spaces. They are composed from four layers that I will explain better later. And most of the dwellings designed by La Coton Vassal are exposed in at least two orientations to allow for cross ventilation. Living areas are systematically oriented to the south or southeast to take advantage of the warming sun. Bedrooms are always located to the north to avoid the heat, sleeping with heat, especially in summer. And in between the spaces, there are non or minimal divisions to allow the air to flow. Doors are often sliding and doors are often sliding everywhere to foster it. The use and function of the winter gardens varies with the seasons. So when both layers are closed here, uh, we can see that the, obviously the blue space is a winter garden and it has two layers, one, the interior one and the exterior one. So when both layers are closed uh, in winter, they function as, as buffer spaces. In summer, both layers are open and the winter garden becomes a balcony. And during the mid season, just we, we can open one or the other one, depending on, on how the temperature is and how the day is. So that the, the occupant can just adapt the space uh, to, to its own need. And this is how, how it looks with all the layers open. It's, it's really just a balcony. In, in summer. So we studied in depth four of their built work to learn from these real buildings. We did surveys, we did left temperature and humidity data loggers and visited to understand how they, they actually work. We, we, it was these four case studies, Cité Manifest in Mulhouse, Bourgeois in Paris and Grand Parc in Bordeaux and the Opal Tower in, in Genève. And, and you, you could see there that actually they, they are placed in a very similar way and the configurations of the units is very similar. So in terms of, of the layers, they are always the same. They have just been improved with time. So from the inside out, we have thermal curtains with a very low U value to insulate in winter and uh, an aluminum, uh, an, an aluminum coating to reflect the sun in summer. The second, Layer is a large double glazing with hot transmission to allow the sun and daylight and very low U value to insulate. In general, the glazing has the 1.1 U value that we were mentioning before. The, the concrete, the, the, the space itself has a concrete finishing to absorb the sun heat and warm up the space even when there is no more sun. It has a regulated depth to heat up sufficient volume of air and allow it to, to pass to the interior. Then the third layer is a cellar curtain with a, with a precisely calibrated opening and reflection from that comes from the greenhouses. So this is literally the technology that is used in greenhouses to avoid solar heat gain and allow daylight. And then the last layer is a large single glazing that has very high uh, light and sun transmission. And of course, it's always slightly open so that there is big infiltration. So to prevent that the space is used as an indoors, this clearly has to be understood as an outdoor intermediate space. And the last bit is a small balcony to prevent the very high summer sun to reach the winter garden. So you can go to the, so the, the environmental benefits that this winter garden brings are numerous. So they provide a shaded outdoor space in summer, protected semi-outdoors in winter, and a larger indoor space in the mid-season. It provides a buffer eff effect, which is a better exterior. It re reduces the heat loss and infiltration of the parent building. It minimizes the, the heated envelope. Not all the, not all the dwelling has to be heated. It also naturally preheats the fresh air incoming to the space. It allows winter natural ventilation without being exposed to such cold air to the outside. 
and it provides generous daylights and views from the insides. It, it has this capacity to adapt seasonally and daylight and and daily, and it has all the features to be able to control the sun, temperature, and and privacy. So these were the again the the four studies, the four case studies that that we did. And in, in each one of them, we left the data loggers. I'm just going to show one example, the case of Urk Jaurès. So in all of the, the units, we left one data logger on the main living room, one in the bedroom, one in the winter garden, and one outdoors. And from here onwards, we, we got some, some key findings, such as during the coldest days of, of winter, we can in here, we can see the, the lowest temperature, the lowest curve, is outdoor temperature, then comes the winter garden and the other two are indoors. So we can see that the winter garden across 10 days in December, I, don't, I think it was 2017 or 18, I don't remember properly, but during all these days, the winter garden was always at three to eight uh, degrees higher than outdoors. If you can go, go back to the other one, thank you. And we can see that in sunny days, of course, the winter garden has a highest the temperature difference because it's it's made for that. It's made to work with the sun, and indoors the set point was a bit high. But uh, this is a learning for the future. But what we want to focus here is in the winter garden itself, which was performing uh, pretty well. Now, yes, if you can go to the next one. So what we did was with uh, with this information and with all the surveys, we try we calibrated our own thermal models to understand. So, so that we could have a sort of digital twin in between the reality and the um, the computer models. And we managed to mimic almost perfectly the behavior of the winter garden. And it, for, for that, we need to adjust very well the thermal inertia, the infiltrations. So there are lots of parameters that had to be adjusted to reach this. And when we look at the regression analysis, the our, our winter garden is modeled with a 93% accuracy, one we could say. And these are all the winter gardens that we modeled and how we calibrated them. So the, the minimum accuracy would be 85% in between all of them. So I'm pretty confident that we managed to mimic the behavior of the winter garden pretty well. And with that, we can actually extrapolate the behavior to the year. And we can see that the winter garden actually behaves the way, like at Amasar, we're intending. Meaning in winter, it acts as a buffer space. The, it's the first graph top left. So it's always at a higher temperature than, than outdoors. And even in the nicest days, it can even reach comfortable te temperatures. During summer, we can see that the winter garden has a very similar temperature to outdoors during, during all the time because we can leave everything open. And the inertia even reduces the temperature of, uh, compared to outdoors during peak days, which is great. And during the mid-season, both spring and autumn, what happens is that the winter garden has nice temperatures during the day, so it can be really used as an extra interior space. And from all of this research, we can actually condense it in this last graph, which shows the winter garden temperature as a function of outdoors. So this kind of graph, we read it, we read it the diagonal line is the outdoor temperature, and the more we have a difference with the outdoor and the points are the winter garden temperature, and we separate it here by by season. So the more we see a difference, the more in between the, for example, in the coldest days, we when it's minus five outside, in the winter garden, it's 10 inside. There is a very large difference. It's working very well. And it's always what, what we were mentioning before, some five degrees on average, we can say maybe above outdoors. And towards the hottest summer days, we can start to see that the temperature of the winter garden starts to be below outdoors, thanks to the effect of the, of the inertia of the concrete. So they really work very well. And all this work that we did with them is going to be published very soon in a book that it's called It's Nice Today. It's still uh, in print. We're still finishing it, but it's going to be published uh, pretty soon, we did all the all the studies for this, and all this work not only is not only going to be a publication; is also used for current projects. 
it could be for this for the first one that is uh, Saint Vincent de Paul. In the next slide, you can uh, pre-order it online already. <laughs> Thank you. This uh, housing project in, in Paris, all the learnings that we are extracting from the research, we are also applying it to the projects we are doing with them. This project will start to be built probably this year. This was a renovation, so the lower part here was a listed uh, building, and we added the, that extension above. And in the next one, you can see the organization of the plan above and below. So even if we are doing, for example, on the lower part, a renovation, they always try to keep the same concepts. Always the the main living spaces will be towards the south, always the bedrooms towards the north. And even if there is no winter garden, we, we try to keep all these principles in the lower part and in the upper part. And in the upper part, we're adding winter gardens on the entire perimeter to see how so we, how we can push forward this this design and all the studies we we generally try to to do all the studies that we do in in SAD for these projects here is just the um, solar radiation incident solar radiation in winter and in summer and in the graphs on the right we can see how in summer there is very very little radiation inside this is due to the to the balconies to the to the solar curtains, to all the devices that they that they use. And down here, you can see the solar radiation in winter, how it penetrates to the winter garden, how it penetrates to the interior space. And to and here, all, we always do the same thermal studies. This, this was just to say, we are extrapolating what we use in the research here. The results are very similar, and we can now start to design further with this. And to to wrap up the studies of this project, I'll, I'll leave to Rafael the last short story about it. Hello. Yeah, I'll pick it up from here. So the next intervention uh, in this project, it relates to the requirement to fill the roof of the project with uh, PV panels. There was a competition requirement to generate a certain amount of electricity on site, 95 megawatt hours. And this meant that all the green roof had to be covered with uh, PV. But in reality, in France, uh, the electricity is mostly nuclear, which means that it uh, has a very low carbon intensity. It's around half of what you would find here in the UK. Uh, so before accepting this imposed uh, solution of the PV panels, we decided to look into the carbon balance of this PV array over time. You have to think that the PV array is not only the PV panels, but it requires a certain substructure made of steel. So the more steel that you put over there, the more carbon that you need to manufacture your system and the longer it takes, it takes for it to pay back. So here in this graph, I don't know if you can see my arrow, probably not. Um, what you have is over time, the brown bars that they represent the amount of carbon that you need to manufacture the system. Then you have the blue bars that they represent the amount of carbon that the system saves over time. And then you have the balance over time that is that line. So when the line crosses the zero axis, the system paid for itself. Ultimately, by analyzing this life cycle in detail, we found out that it would take 45 years for this system to pay for itself in terms of carbon. So it didn't really make sense to cover the entire roof of the project with a PV system. And instead of doing that, instead of allowing our building to consume more energy and then generating it on site, what we decided was to lower the target that we had for energy consumption on site, getting rid of the system altogether. Because in the end, what we think is it's about understanding what we need to calculate and how, and not just applying a standard solution that was given and imposed from, from the brief. And during that time, uh, all the politicians in Paris are just promoting PV panels because they need to show a quick solution for resolving their election. <laughs> another case where this happened, another battle, uh, was in this residential project in Hamburg, which is an 11-story building, also designed by Lacaton Vassal, it's a residential building. But in this case, the battle was a, was a different one. 
The climate is quite cold in Hamburg and buildings are usually equipped with uh, very complex mechanical systems with uh, heat recovery, which means that they need pipes uh, to bring the air in and to extract the air out and they get quite sophisticated and take out or take up a big portion of the budget. That means that when you're doing a low cost or affordable housing, uh, a significant part of the budget has to go to the system and doesn't go into the buildings itself or into the residential units for the people to inhabit. Unfortunately, these systems are often enforced by engineers without much consideration to the project-specific needs. So in this, uh, in this case, the battle wants to work on and demonstrate whether the features that uh, Florencia has been uh, commenting about the winter gardens, the, the fact that they reduce the heat loss to the envelope and the fact that they can preheat the ventilation air that comes into the apartment, whether that was sufficiently good to get rid of a system that would be very costly for the project. Ultimately, the air required uh, to ventilate the apartments comes through this winter garden, these uh, spaces that are situated on the facade towards the east and toward the, towards the west, and they preheat uh, the air that comes inside. They are closed in winter, obviously, and then they open in summer. As we've seen, winter gardens will provide these two main benefits to the parent building. On one side, they will buffer from the, uh, uh, from the extreme outdoor temperatures. So here in the graph, you can see that all the colorful lines are the temperatures on the winter gardens. And they're always in between 5 to 7 degrees uh, warmer than outside. And also, they're used to preheat the air. So ultimately, because of the winter garden design, uh, the building actually performs by itself and it doesn't need all the complex mechanical ducts uh, that the building originally required. That meant that the team could save around 200,000 euros in avoiding that system and put them in, this, uh, in the social spaces and in, the sp in these uh, additional buffer spaces that the building can offer. Instead of having a system do this function, the function is carried out by these pleasant semi outdoor spaces, which are usable, uh, usable by the occupants uh, through the seasons. This brings us to the importance of intermediate spaces, which are spaces that regulate the outdoor climate, uh, which are spaces that regulate the transition between a, the building and outdoors. They increase, they increase the relation of the building itself with outdoors when the climate is mild, when temperatures outside are nice, and they buffer from it when the temperatures outside are very harsh, either very hot or very cold. Because ultimately, as uh, we've been showing through all these case studies, uh, we believe that the, the envelope does not necessar necessarily need to be a line between indoors and outdoors. It can be conceived as a space that generates a milder microclimate and that can also be used by occupants throughout the seasons. Which in turn protects the envelope from extreme temperatures outside. For example, in colder climates, we need more enclosed intermediate spaces that generate heat using the sun, such as the winter gardens from Lagadon Basal we just saw. While in warmer climates, we need to generate shade, such as those uh, by Vladimir Acosta that we saw earlier. So I'm going to show you now a couple of projects um, that build on these ideas. The first of them is the new European Library in, in Milan. Is the result of a competition that we won with uh, Bauku and on-site studio. And the building is composed of six floors and divided mainly into volumes. Here you can see how the, the building is divided. You see that the, there's a north volume that includes the main entrance to the building, here on the left bottom side. Then we have a media library that is spread over these three floors that you see marked in red. Then we have a forum space uh, on the top and a vertical atrium that connects the entrance all the way through the building to this forum space on the top. This atrium serves as the circulation and the connection space all throughout the building. On the other side, we have a more traditional uh, volume, which includes uh, the library and office spaces that also benefits from the atrium on one side and faces south on the other extreme. The building structure uh, was done with a hybrid structure. So it's composed of a hybrid slab that includes uh, CLT plus a little bit of concrete that provides some thermal mass for the very hot summers in Milan, while it keeps the embodied carbon in the structure at a relatively acceptable level. The 
This is an image of the central atrium, which is, as we were discussing, is conceived as an intermediate space. It's an area of the building that tames the climate and creates a transition between the outdoors and the inner spaces. Its temperature is uh, regulated naturally, so it's not conditioned, uh, and, and it's regulated naturally across the seasons due to the adaptability of the envelope. So we have numerous features uh, on, the, on the top, windows that open, shading that deploys, and we're going to see how it performs uh, briefly now. But it, beca it becomes crucial for this space to have an acceptable temperature to have this adaptability through, through the envelope. So through the seasons, uh, you can see on the left side how it performs, uh, how it performs in winter. The atrium is uh, heated up by the sun. So all the windows are closed, and the heat accumulated by the, by the sun makes, uh, makes this space around 5 to 10 degrees warmer than outside. That not only increases uh, the temperature on, on this circulation space, but also allows uh, to the adjacent spaces to benefit from it. So it reduces the energy demand of the heated spaces that are next to it, that are heated to 20 degrees, and it reduces the requirements for insulation on all the surfaces that are in contact with this atrium. During spring and autumn and some of the mild summer days, the, the behavior and the adaptability of the envelope changes and allows to open up the building to, a milder, to milder outdoor temperatures. So we have all the windows in the atrium itself that are open, and we have uh, the windows on the inner spaces that are also open. So all the heat generated by the occupants and the computers is actually dissipated by natural ventilation. And the sun, the strong, the strong Milanese sun, is blocked by a movable textile shading that deploys uh, outside uh, the building. During the very extreme summer days in Milan, temperatures get quite hot, and it can reach uh, 35 days, uh, 35 degrees, multiple days in a row. So windows are closed uh, to prevent this hot air from coming in, and the shading is deployed. How the building performs uh, during those days, it remains uh, closed as a cave almost during the day, and, uh, and dissipates, or uh, the concrete structure will absorb uh, the excess heat. And while during the night, all these windows will open again to allow some uh, natural ventilation to get rid of the heat that we have accumulated during the day. The following morning, when the temperatures outside uh, rise, the windows are closed, and we are ready to begin the cycle again. But all this strategy doesn't come without challenges. Um, Milan has traditionally been known for its uh, worrying air pollution. As it is surrounded by the Alps, the city suffers from very little wind that can take out all the pollutants, that, uh, that can disperse the local pollutants. So as a consequence, there are almost no new buildings that are naturally ventilated, as the status quo prevents from doing so. This, this is quite a long battle just to be able to simply open a window, but there are other considerations that are sometimes have to be coordinated within the team, and this is one of the challenges that we've, we've been facing on this project. But however, when we look at the detailed data about local pollutions, we can start to see some, some patterns, right? Uh, when we see on the, on the screen, it's a graph with the daily, with the daily pollution levels dating back all the way to 2015. Uh, what we have highlighted in blue over this graph is the season during which the building needs to naturally ventilate, while the winters, the colder, pe colder period, is left in white. You see that there's a horizontal red line that is the target recommended by uh, European standards or what is acceptable to have as a pollution level uh, to naturally ventilate or not. So on one side, what we see here is that air pollution is far better during summer, which is when we need to naturally ventilate, and is far worse during winter. Um, we see that all the big peaks, they happen during winter, while during uh, the natural ventilation season, values are relatively low. Uh, that means that we are mostly uh, below targets and that we can naturally ventilate the building. But not only that, if we look at the tabulated values below, you see that the number of days while, uh, when the target is actually exceeded it has been decreasing since 2015. 
That is because Milan has slowly been introducing measures to improve air quality, such as banning the pollution of, car, uh, of uh, banning polluting cars, or giving incentives uh, to a more efficient heating systems or electric transport. Which means that by the time the library opens in 2027, uh, pollution levels will be more than acceptable to have a naturally ventilated building. And I forgot to put it here, but the fact that we can naturally ventilate the building, it translates into a reduction on cooling loads to roughly half of what we will have otherwise. The second project uh, is located in Madrid. It's a new building of uh, 159 housing units designed by Tottenham Architectos and Javier García Germán. The project is composed of two horizontal buildings, two horizontal bars, each of them with two towers of around nine to 10 floors. And the massing was shaped to generate two other spaces within them and the heart of each building. So they are open to the sun from the, from the south. This project uh, was also uh, promoted by a local public uh, authority and is meant for social housing. So that meant that there was a very reduced budget to build all these houses, and that meant that we couldn't have uh, double-oriented uh, house uh, residential units that they could cross-ventilate. They had to be uh, shaped around a central corridor that would give, give us access for both of them. You can imagine that in Madrid, during summer peak days, uh, temperatures reach 35 to 40 degrees. So having apartments that face an internal corridor and, and that they cannot cross-ventilate becomes a real problem. So the strategy here uh, was to actually naturally ventilate the corridor itself. So instead of leaving the corridor completely disconnected from outside, the, the building introduces th uh, three layers or three air paths that allow to naturally ventilate all the spaces. The first one works for the entire building, and it's uh, these corridors that touch the facade on very strategic points to promote natural ventilation. The second one works for the residential units, that they have a main facade facing outside, and then a secondary facade facing this corridor. And then the last one works for the common spaces. On some of the areas where these corridors touch uh, the facade, uh, the space is enlarged to generate a common area for the residents. So you can see here in the picture that there is an area with a much larger glazed uh, window, and that becomes a common space that is uh, open in summer to allow the air to circulate through the building, and it's uh, passively conditioned to be used by, by the users. The location of uh, all these uh, spaces that connect the corridors to the, to the outside, essentially, that allow natural ventilation, um, was defined with multiple CFD studies that were coordinated with the architect. So they explored multiple layout uh, plans and options, and we tested them and gave them feedback on which one would perform better, which one would perform worse, and eventually we landed on a solution that was, that was working well for the natural ventilation and that was working well for the layout of the building itself. So even if the units have one facade only towards the outside, they can cross-ventilate through these corridors. You can see that on the, on the unit level, there is a primary circulation and a secondary one. Depending on the orientation and the, of the apartment and the wind direction, either the, the air will flow from the facade through the apartment into the door, into the corridor, or it will be all the way around. It will flow from the corridor into the apartment to the facade. To allow this airflow through the entrance, uh, to the, to, through the entrance into the corridor, the doors uh, were designed so that they have a separate side panel, so, it can be, so that it can be left open, and uh, while well, still ensure some privacy and safety. The common spaces we saw on some of uh, the points where the corridors touch uh, this other facade are designed so that during summer they freshen the incoming air. They have an evaporative cooling system on the facade that remains fully open, so it pre-cools the air as it flows into the building. And then during cooler days in autumn and winter, they are, they are pleasantly heated by the sun, so they don't require any additional heating. And I think with this one, I'm gonna hand it over to Olivier. So this part is, is named valorizing the existing. So sometimes we need to adapt spaces Sometimes we can adapt to spaces. 
So buildings in the past were designed in response to the local climate to create indoor spaces that are naturally comfortable as a result of their architectural configuration and features. Today we inherit their common sense and their qualities that have helped them sustain themselves over time. So some existing buildings are exemplary and it is only sensible for us to propose punctual interventions by first considering all existing qualities prior to adding anything and to aim to avoid generic solutions that would not only compromise the, pot the patrimonial value of the building but also increase the carbon footprint and the cost unnecessarily. So with, with new design tools and increasingly sophisticated technologies, we can now retrieve more of the common sense embedded within these historical buildings instead of overwriting their virtues with energy intensive machines, which has been the case until very recently. So th this project is, is called the Old Ateliers of Picasso in bois um, And this is an ongoing project, but we've done the first part, which consisted of diagnosing the existing building. And what we are working with Lacaton Vassal on this one. So in 1930, Picasso bought the Chateau bois in Normandy, close to the region of the Vexin, where Monet and Van Gogh also painted. Uh, the building has two levels and is composed of thick stone walls. Uh, the slabs are made of rammed earth and the roof structure is made of wood. Picasso sculpted behind these iconic white doors and occasionally you can find traces and signatures of the painter on the walls. So th this is how the building looks today and its, its use is still related to art uh, for small exhibitions. However, they want to open the to the public, they want to open up the building to the public and adapt the space to host even more exhibitions. So we thought the intervention should be as minimal and precise as possible to avoid altering um, the patrimonial building. So in order to do a precise intervention, um, we need a precise diagnosis. So same thing, we applied the SED methodology, we, this whole story with data loggers where we record um, the temperature, the humidity, the natural behavior, we understand it first and uh, we can then calibrate our thermal models to mimic the real behavior um, in order to make finer predictions. So we studied the temperature inside throughout the year and mapped the results over space. Um, to avoid any degradation of the art pieces in the exhibition spaces, specific requirements are needed in terms of exposure to light to temperature and to humidity fluctuations. So treating the space only mechanically would be very energy intensive. So instead of altering the spaces that have good qualities and patrimonial value, we propose to alter human behavior. Some spaces will only host exhibitions during the time of the year they can. You see here um, annual uh, chart showing you in green when the conditions required by the preservation of art pieces are met. When it's red, it's too hot, and in blue, it's too cold. And that's a percentage of time spent in those conditions. So then you can sort of look, okay, so well, let's do exhibitions from May to September in that space, perhaps only from June, July in that other space. On the upper level, the intervention could be heavier to make the spaces ideal for more permanent uses, while the ateliers on the ground level would work passively and occupation would adapt to whenever the conditions are naturally ideal. This architectural project is more about informing on when the exhibition can open rather than intervening on the building itself. There's another project, it's, um, also ongoing with Lacaton Vassal. Um, the context is very distinct from Picasso project. Uh, but the approach is, uh, that we're taking is as sensitive. Uh, the Camp Nagel Theatre in Hamburg, um, it's one of Germany's biggest independent production venue for the performing arts. The building used to be a mechanical engineering factory from 1865 to 1982 for the production of large machinery such as loading gear and cranes. Since then, the Camp Nagel has been hosting and producing cultural activities, theater and dance performance and concerts. The site also hosts a number of festivals, such as the Internationalis Sommerfestival 
and the people of the Camp Nagel have led the theater to become one of the city's most popular, lively and cherished area. The building is considered a heritage to the city. When visiting the place, one can feel how much the space got appropriated by the people. Graffitis over signs of Spreien verboten are now protected. The goal of the project is to preserve the culture embedded within the walls and to define inter an intervention as minimum as possible, only to improve its energy efficiency and levels of comfort so that after is better than before. The building is made of brick walls and steel structures. Ceilings are very high. Some windows are painted in black. Some are broken. Some are replaced. Other are graffitied. So in this case, again, we did a complete diagnosis in the same way we did for bois with a detailed survey of the envelope. You can see here um, all the various types of glazing that we cared to survey from the double glazing to all the different types of single glazing, broken, frosted, graffitis, uh, et cetera, so on and so forth. We placed 11 data loggers, once again, same story. <laughs> Um, on all the key spaces, the venues, uh, sometimes two per uh, big room to understand what happens um, at the bottom of those spaces, what happens at the top of those spaces. Similarly, again, to bois we were able to map over space and over time the temperatures inside the spaces and understand what can be done at which time of the year. So, although walls are protected, windows are not. And actually, some are currently covered to blacken interior spaces for the performance. During the day, these condemned windows keep the spaces dark, even when the building is used for exhibitions or rehearsing. However, historically, this was a bright industrial building. These are daylight simulations showing the before and after windows are covered. Um, on the left, 1980 potential, and today, 2022. So our intention will be to restore the original qualities with its brightness, original brick walls, and to provide an adequate blackout system that is adaptable by the people of the Camp Nagel. Uh, this project is uh, the residual, residual volumes of La Défense in Paris. Uh, we're collaborating with uh, this Belgium practice called Baukunst, led by Adrien Ferchouare. It's an ongoing project, but we did the first phase already. Uh, below the Esplanade of La Défense in Paris, there are large, un large unused volumes in between highways and metros built in concrete, several tens of thousands of square meters of underground space unused. The intervention seeks to valorize those spaces by bringing livable conditions underground to host various programs such as exhibition spaces, sports equipments, ateliers and others. The project creates an underground promenade that connects all the new spaces and that sometimes opens to the sky to let air and light in. And the, the, story, the funny story behind this project is that we participated in this competition, this public competition, with Lacaton and Vassal, and we lost against Baukunst. We had done outdoor comfort studies on the Esplanade. Um, the client found our studies interesting and invited us to join the winning team. Uh, when we joined, uh, we saw the engineers that were supposedly in charge of sustainability had uh, specified to cover all the underground spaces with insulation. This would have created a completely different image and would have disconnected the spaces of the existing thermal inertia of the concrete and of the ground. And it would have created a thermos space, like Florencia explained earlier, a thermos, entirely dependent on machines to regulate the conditions. So we propose to place data loggers and record <laughs> temperatures to see that the temperatures inside the spaces were constant due to the, the abundance of thermal inertia, regardless of outdoor air fluctuations. So you can see here, the black lines fluctuating are the outdoor temperatures, the one we measured and the one of the weather station, and the lines that are quite horizontal are the temperatures inside um, these underground spaces. So this highlighted the potential for these spaces to be naturally fit to host the new densely occupied programs. Once again, with a calibrated thermal model, we calculated the resulting heating and cooling demand of all the spaces with and without insulation. It is true that heating 
is slightly higher if we don't insulate the space. But it is also true that there is no need for cooling anymore uh, when we don't insulate. If we installed insulation, uh, the, the cooling system would have been needed. Um, In this case, the total carbon balance, sorry, we, further to the heating load and the cooling load, we also calculated the carbon emissions over 50 years. We did a, what we call a, a life cycle analysis. And considering the embodied carbon of the insulation, the energy needed to fabricate it, and its impact on operational energy, so the carbon emissions uh, relative to the consumption of energy relative to heating and cooling and ventilation, you can see here the relative proportions of the loads and of the carbon footprint. So the small big dots and the rounds on the left without insulation, uh, on the left insulated, the big spot and the red, the heating, the blue spot, the cooling. And the other case with the exposed concrete without insulation, um, slightly more heating, no cooling and no uh, carbon due to the insulation. So, Adding the insulation implied three times more carbon emissions over 50 years than not adding any. Um, it is important to value what there is and not to fall down to generic solutions, which was a big battle that we led uh, with those engineers, long discussions, um, and having scientific evidence to arbitrate the debate is uh, much more constructive. This uh, last bit uh, called uh, the reading the invisible uh, uh, during the Biennale of Architecture in Versailles in last summer uh, in Paris. The exhibition revolved around the subject of the visible and invisible, touching on the question of materials and energy. The exhibition took place in a space called La Nef of La Maréchalerie. Um, we named our installation Reading the Invisible. It consisted in quantifying the invisible environmental factors of the exhibition space itself and projecting from above the dynamic animations of the results onto a 1 to 50 model of the exhibition space sliced at one meter height. I hope that makes sense, but the picture tells. The objective was to raise awareness in the wider public about the environmental factors that are responsible for the human physiological sensations, air temperature, humidity, air quality, surface temperatures, solar radiation, winds, daylight, view to the sky, or to outdoors. How they vary in space and over time, and by displaying them to trigger the thoughts on how we can actually design the air. The installation makes possible to relate the simulation results with the live daylight levels, solar variations, and thermal sensations in the exhibition space. This was a picture of the installation. I'd like to show you quickly a video um, of what was projected. Obviously, this is a remake of what we were seeing uh, flattened, but essentially, visitors could see this model of the space they were experiencing. And um, this is accelerated, but you can see here that we tried to explain the legends, explain what we were showing, um, show how dynamic it is through time and over space and as one passes in front of the installation, can assess whether these statistical predictive models are a good tool or not to design what we cannot see. Um, here I'm, I'm not seeing the video, just... I, was, I think we're seeing it here. Okay, for the people on the screen, we're not seeing it, just so that you know. Oh my. Oh, <laughs> I think it continues sharing the presentation. Oh no. Shall you slide it to the side? If I slide it to the side? It shows now, yeah. There we go. You can drag it to the top. Good call, Florencia. Yeah. The dynamic variations over space and time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, yeah, it took it took a while. It was quite playful to to quantify the measures, to select the indicators that um, were 
uh, that could speak to, to any visitor who's not an expert to portray variation over time, show the, the day going by. Um, You're still in the video. I'm still in the video. Yeah. I'm going to try to. Can you. Uh, I, yeah, you, you. Oh my yes. god. Maybe Alt F4? No. Mm -hmm. Ah, you're good. Now. There we go. Yeah. So, as a, as a closing si a slide, um, is the, this is the floor plan of uh, all the installation during the Biennale and the list of participants who made installations. And um, for us, being the, the only environmental design consultancy invited to participate in this Biennale of Architecture amongst exclusively architects is a promising sign for our discipline and perhaps a sign of a shift in what architecture can be about. Thank you very much. Two questions. The first is, are you hiring? <laughs> because next week we'll have 18 people <laughs> looking for work. <laughs> we are very yeah, much yeah. hiring. <laughs> the other question, very small question, is about the, um, uh, the winter garden. I mean, I, I think it's aptly that the, the words winter garden have been used a lot over the last fi 50 years, and very often they it was nothing of a garden, much more like, um, let's say, a uh, barren conservatory that became occupied by bicycles and rubbish. But there, I think, uh, the, the plan already, architecturally, looks like it is designed with that space. That, that space is not an addition. In fact, it forms a situation when it opens in, in its different ways. So then, uh, I think it was the first time that I saw it in this way, because I think you had mentioned it before, but I hadn't looked at the plan. <clears throat> I mean, if you put it up, maybe it will be possible for others to, to comment on it, because I think it's really a very interesting composition. But um, then, um, <laughs> I thought that the distance between the, let's say, the living room and the outdoor is probably something like three meters, because the, the, the winter garden is about two meters, the balcony is another meter. So then now th this is an underside situation because it will make the floor below really very dark, doesn't it? Because it, like you have a, Three meter overhang above you. So, it, but but again, that can be justified and say that well, the architects have given more to this element than to the living room. That the living room perhaps is not a daytime. Even. I don't know, but I think it uh, actually maybe I, I can start to reply. It was another plan. We we had thought so. We had thought the same thing at the beginning, but when we did the, the proper daylight studies in the publication, we, we show all, all the a range of studies for this lecture we just selected apart. But when we did the daylight studies, we can see that the living room has actually a lot more daylight than any traditional building built today. We did comparisons with the standard windows, for example, and it, it it actually has more daylight because the visible transmittance of the first because all of the facade is glazed, the visible transmittance of the outer layer is 0.9 and the inner layer is 0 0.6. So it's pretty high and there is quite a lot of daylight inside actually. It's Maybe also, it's also a, a if you Rafael and Olivia want to add something. It's a transparent double facade system from floor to ceiling 
which even though you may not have, let's say in the middle of the living room, you may, you may or may not have 300 locks in order to read comfortably without turning on the lights, you still have an impression of brightness because you actually see outside very much. And if you choose to read, then for most of the year, you can occupy the winter garden to, to open your book. Um, <laughs> the bar. <laughs> you just realize that the building will close at 8 o'clock, so if you wanted to have any games, then we should rush to the bar. Could you just ask some questions? I don't know if there are. I think your work is wonderful. Um, I just think what would be interesting perhaps for you to consider is the benefit of plants. Uh, <clears throat> there's been lots and lots and lots of studies showing <clears throat> that if you, have, if you live with lots of plants, they um, um, sorry, purify the air. You know, and all the all this, the, the work which has been done in um, <clears throat> with cities like Milan, etc., where the pollution may be quite high, that the uh, developing on the concept of your your winter garden, but that the, the I mean, <coughs> the idea that you use plants to create an environment which is uh, environmentally very healthy. Thank you. Any other? Two very brief comments, guys. Thank you very much. Um, very clear and interesting architecture and environmental together. Uh, it's, uh, one is um, a curiosity. I mean, you often said a few times, and I think we would like to understand, when you said often the SED methodology. I said, oh, wow, so there is an SED methodology. Um, the SED is here. <laughs> if you could very briefly tell us, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you speak with a lot of um, confidence and, and you know what you're talking about. So how would you define the SED methodology? That's one question. Um, and the second one is, um, if you could very briefly tell us a little bit how how is your relationship with the architects? Because you are architects, Oliver, as well. I just made you one. Um, so you you talk with a, a, lot, a lot of knowledge of the, the architectural design. Um, do you think, I mean, in essence, how is the relationship? Is it you feel you are part of the creative process as well? because of the tools, because of the measurements, because of the SED methodology. If you could elaborate a bit on that. In terms of the relationship with the architect, uh, we found it quite crucial that we work with uh, people that we have worked before. So when we start a new project with someone with a project leader or an architecture firm that is the first time. It's, it takes always a little bit of time on getting to know each other, us understanding how they work, how they design, and them understanding when to ask the questions uh, or the design feedback that we can provide. But then the second project or the second uh, intervention that we make together with them, we build on that shared experience that we forge on that project, on the first one, and then so on and so forth. And I think projects in general, the projects that we make, they can reach much uh, better performances, they can become much uh, richer as we design uh, together with, this, uh, with these architects. But it's, it's almost always that is the case that it builds up on, on previous collaborations. It, it depends from one type of collaboration or another. Uh, some architects are very keen to make use of this information, um, are very let's say, uh, sensitive or uh, compatible with, uh, with this way of thinking, to, to make use of the scientific evidence, to be able to deduce uh, um, and to read uh, what, uh, how things are actually performing and to decide accordingly. Um, some, it's, it's, it, every collaboration with the, the different architects that we've interacted with is very distinct. 
one from another. Um, the one with Lacaton Vassal is has reached levels that uh, are that we could not have expected because they they understand this physics and this science very much, and so we are in a dialogue where we think about these projects um, uh, with them. And, and, and in some projects, it could turn out also to be very relevant, like another project they could also do without us and because they have a different approach to it. Um, sometimes it's, um, there's a lot of battles on the way to make ourselves heard. Um, sometimes numbers don't, are not enough. Sometimes it's, there are things we don't necessarily understand, but then we tend to go away from anyone who's not willing to listen. But uh, that's quite natural. And, and the SED methodology, um, it's all, you know. Maybe, can I add to the final point before going to the methodology? I, I think that about the relationship with the architects, uh, as the guys were saying, it changes a lot based on who. And it, it also improves with the projects, as uh, as Rafael was saying. But there is one point that uh, Joan asked, that you, you asked if we felt a part of the project or not. And I think that... It, it has to do with what they were saying, what sometimes the first time it's it's more about us introducing to them. But it, it's very nice to see that as, as projects come by, the architects start to ask the, the correct questions or the, the questions that we can actually answer and they start to think with our tools. And there's where we start to feel more a part of the design. So if you see more collaborations with one architect, it feels that we are actually now a part and a, a part of the design, but the first interactions, it's it's always more difficult. But now, yes, it starts to be a big topic of design. We are investing our time into training their project leaders so that the conversation from competition to competition to projects ends up somewhere uh, environmentally friendly. And the quickly on the SED methodology, the, it's everything we've said today. We were we've learned this way during the postgraduate program, and it seems to be a very effective way at understanding existing buildings, um, uh, a method of research, um, a logic based on scientific evidence, um, and a way to define architecture and to pay attention to climate, a way to mine uh, carbon emissions, uh, a way to be more sober and um, create positive impacts. In those way. Okay, I just wanted to, to say a very short uh, thing. First, uh, thank you so much. It was a wonderful, uh, very interesting presentation. And I'm sure that, um, as you just said, the SED uh, program or studies provided you a strong uh, way of, uh, of uh, communicating with either engineers or, or architects with evidence and demonstrating, not just with words, but also demonstrating um, all, all, all the ideas that you, you are proposing. I, I would just like to add that maybe the next step now would be to, you know, to start to see, because all you do is, is uh, estimations. And so what about the post occupancy? So you then have evidence to show that things really work to potential new clients. And I must also congratulate you for the battles that you must have been uh, for achieving. So thank you so much. Yeah, actually, actually, on the, on the um, evaluation of our projects, is this working? Yeah. So far, I mean, obviously, when we started, we didn't have any of our own project to evaluate. So we started this uh, research with Lacan Thomas uh, learning from their build precedent. But now in some of the projects that we are designing and they're about to get built, the, either the city of Paris or the client is including a post-occupancy evaluation as a part of the task. So when the time comes, uh, it's already included there and it will help us develop and learn even more. I think ideally that should be included in every single building, but the reality is that very few of them have that, that ambition to understand and to learn for the next one. And, yeah. and, the, and actually, if, if I may add to, to that, the research that we would like at Vassal was almost like a, a, an inverted process because we started by the data loggers and we started by by saying, okay, how it, it's almost as if we were justifying what they did at the beginning and now we're using it to to move forward, which 
uh, which is also helpful in the end. It's also it's always a, a loop. So we believe that 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 relationship started very strongly because it started from from there. It started from the real buildings and and measuring. And if I just can add to the what we consider the SED met- methodology, there is something that. We found people are very surprised about, which is looking at the free running mode. No one out there in common practice in, in, in the build, maybe yes, in, in England, but in France and in, in, in Italy and in other places, it's not coming to look at the free running mode to work with architectural parameters and to actually understand temperature. People out there just focus on energy. So I think that it's, we take it very much uh, as as a part of the SED methodology, the data loggers and the free running mode and first. Also, in a, but we're only six years old, and uh, and it just the cycle of designing buildings is is starting to have a rotation where we're starting to have, see some buildings uh, come out, uh, you know, and get built. Um, six years ago, when we started, um, if we take the because a lot of this started in France in the context of Paris with uh, La Caton Vassal. Um, the context was very different. Uh, we had conversations about sustainability, um, and we tried to argue about the importance of it. Um, and then the next year, the re- thermal regulations in France started changing. And then um, events happened around the globe that started to shock people, and then the awareness about climate changing has been widespread, and suddenly it's kind of established, and we're, we're into it. Now we're thinking about how much adoption into solutions, et cetera. So now the conversation is shifting and we're trying to, um, uh, we're finally getting into more interesting uh, dialogues, finally. Um. It seems to me me like there is no AA bar tonight because it's just, (laughs) so then if there are more questions, yeah, they welcome. Anyone? Okay, well, thanks again, guys. Thank you very much to all the SED, and thank and you. So. Flo, hoping to see you in London soon. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Simas, thank for you, teaching Simas. us all of this. <laughs>